Hallelujah, he is risen. <laughs> I hope you know, I hope you recognize and realize it is still Easter. Easter isn't a day, it's not an event, it's a whole season that has impacted all of history. Before it happened, while it was happening, and after it's happened, will have always an impact from now and forever. Easter is a wonderful season, uh, and it keeps going because it is the most awesomest thing that has ever happened, ever. Uh, God decided that he was going to enact a whole new uh, regime, that, that life, as we know it, would be different, that we could be forgiven, that our, our sins could be removed from us, and those who would receive this can have it for free. That God would go into the world, be tortured, humiliated, mount a cross and die for us, and then come back isn't something that we just forget about, like a sale at Walmart or something. This is something that goes on and on and on. It has an incredible impact for everybody's life for always and forever. And there is no extent to the love or the power that our God shows us, which is why we made a whole bunch of uh, menstrual pads, which might be the oddest thing in the world. I hope you all see this. I'm pulling this out. 510 menstrual pads. I think there are 51 bags here also, just kind of just like a little add-on here. I don't know, I can imagine, if you live in a world where you don't have a menstrual pad, that is literally a gift from God. And that might be an awkward thing to think about, and I'm okay with that. I'm alright with getting into the awkward places because our God has no place that he won't go, up to and including death and menstrual pads, as it turns out. These are going to go with Linda. I know I saw you, Linda. Where are you? Ha, Linda Higdahl. Linda is going to be heading off. Where are you heading off to, Linda? Ethiopia to bring these pads, which y'all made and the quilters made a lot of. You know, I had to go in there on Fridays with the whip and put them to work because they, you know, went to slack off. But we, we have a sweatshop. I don't know if you know that. In, <laughs> in the other building. And, and we, we, uh, we don't actually employ anybody. It's all slave labor. <laughs> and they have worked diligently for the kingdom of God in some menstrual pads. Because God's reign includes everything. That when God takes control of the world, that's what we call the kingdom of heaven. And his reign doesn't have bounds. It goes to everywhere. And it will go with Linda to Ethiopia. And it will go because of y'all doing some work. I don't remember if you remember we had a couple times where you would cut out patterns, just cut out patterns, and they were sewn together, and, and they're going to go, and they're going to do some great things. This might seem a little awkward, and it might seem, you know, maybe this isn't the best sermon topic, but you know what, I really, I can't think of a better sermon topic than this one, because we like to think of, of these things as, you know, other things, but this is how the kingdom of God works. The kingdom of God is so wonderful that God would take control of everything in our life, that we wouldn't think that there could be anything better. One example that I love to bring out, I'm going to bring out here, is it, it's as if you were walking by and you saw a field, and in that field there was a treasure. Like, like you just happened to see there was like a big pile of gold. So you, you hid it in the ground, you sold everything you had so you could buy that plot of land, because you knew that in that plot of land would be this awesome treasure, and you didn't stop at anything to get that treasure. That's the kingdom of God. Or another one is as if you spent your whole life looking for something, like a beautiful, the most perfect, round, beautiful, illustrious pearl ever. And you spent your whole life looking for this pearl, and you finally found it. And so then you couldn't do anything but sell everything you owned just so that you could possess this pearl. The kingdom of God is so amazing that, that when it enters into our life, it's hard to believe that there is some kind of goodness out there that would be doing this. And if you live in a world where, where everybody says, you know, uh, you're, you're lesser, or you're not valuable, or the, the things that you go through aren't worth contributing uh, for us to contribute to, uh, then, then it seems like the world is not a very good or a happy place. Uh, and if you think that somehow I shouldn't be talking about menstruation, I want you to think about what that says to our daughters. This is, this is something that, that I've been wrestling with ever since I came up with this idea that we're going to talk about menstruation pads today, which is that this, this thing that happens to women, to our daughters, gentlemen, 
is a fine and a normal and a natural thing. And as soon as we tell them to be quiet and put it in the corner, then what are we telling our daughters? That there is some aspect of their life that, that isn't valuable? But this gap is exactly what has happened in Ethiopia. There's this huge gap where the society that these girls, these women live in, tell them, no, you need to go over there, you need to find yourself a place to do whatever, because you're not going to engage with the normal culture, we're not going to have a place for you. And so Linda has decided that she's going to be the light of God, and Crosswood, we got behind her, we're going to send her out, and we are going to be God's love. And it turns out that God's love in Ethiopia is going to look like menstrual pads. Thanks be to God. And I'm great with that. And I hope you are too because God is big and huge and he's in every last bit of our lives. And as soon as we said, no, God can't go here, then we shrink God just a little bit more. And as soon as God can't go here and he can't be here and he's not allowed to touch this and not allowed to engage with this and all of a sudden God gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And if you have a small God, then it doesn't take much more than a weak demon to pull you away. And that would be a horrible thing. Our God is a big God. Bigger than whatever might attack you. Bigger than whatever problems you might be coming across. And there will be problems. There are going to be problems. And the biggest, hardest, most difficult thing you can do when you have problems is realize and recognize other people have the same problems. Because the the reality is we have this thing where we don't talk about stuff. And we we go through stuff and we say, no, 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 I don't really want to bring that out. And we have things that we're not allowed to bring up. Especially in church. Don't bring up sex in church. Don't bring up addiction. Don't bring up... All the other little things, these social conformities that, that, that we're not allowed to bring up. And these become cages that we put ourselves in and separate us from God. They become walls that society says that we're not allowed to engage in because God wouldn't or the church wouldn't or the people wouldn't or whatever else that is. And all of a sudden, we're fenced in, we're hemmed in. And God's plan can't get in. And then we're lost, pushed to the side, off into a deep place where there's this gap the beautiful thing is that there are missionaries in this world, thanks be, Linda, and we, we plan to send some out. We're taking little baby steps, our first little baby steps, into Atlanta. Now, really, Atlanta should not, be, should not be a big problem. But the reality is we don't have a culture here at Crossroad of doing that, of sending missionaries out, of sending people out, which is what we're going to do. We're going to partner up with some congregations in Atlanta, and, and people have asked me, what are we doing? You know what my answer is? I don't know. I don't care. We're going to go. Somebody else has the, has the vision. We're just going to be the backs. They've got programs. They've got things they're doing. If you really want to know, talk to Paul. Paul's the head of the, of the mission team, the E-team. He's being shy right now. But he is not a shy man, I assure you. He knows. He's got the details. And we're going to go, and we're going to do whatever needs to be done Whatever gaps there are, wherever God is not present in the inner city of Atlanta or whatever it is we're going to do, we're going to do it. We're going to be servants, which is what a servant does. Here I am serving. Here I am. Call me. Here I am ready to go, and we're going to go. And it, it, it might be difficult for you to get to that place where you say, here I am. Call me, which is exactly what Isaiah said. He said, here I am. I'm ready to go. And you might say, I can't be a missionary. I can't do that. I can't lead a Bible study. I can't find time in my life for this. I can't give this up. I can't do whatever I need to do. And, and, and my first response to you is, own that. Be honest with yourself. Be honest with your God. You can't hide from him. Be honest. God knows what's going on. Say, hey, I can't be a missionary. But then recognize that what you're saying is that fear is more important than God. What you're saying is, what I got going on in my life is more important than whatever it is God might have in store. What you're saying is, I'm afraid of whatever I might encounter when I go out, and I don't think God can protect me in that situation. What you're saying is, you have a small God who isn't capable of doing things. And just because you can't see how God will work doesn't mean that God can't work. In fact, if you want to see miracles, you have to step out into them. You have to step out into the place where God only can work. 
And then when it happens, when everything works out, when things fall in line, when, when things that you didn't expect were possible all of a sudden become possible, then you get to see the hand of God. Because our God has power over life and death. What can't he accomplish? There is nothing that he can't accomplish. Every single person hearing my voice right now, if you have ears, listen. God is bigger than what you think. And canon wants to do things through you that you haven't even fathomed yet. And if you're honest and you say, I don't want to be a martyr, well, at least you're honest. But I can't call that good. I have to call that small. But you're in good company. The disciples, every last one of them were in the same place. In our reading today, they were hiding, not in an open place, but in a secret place, behind doors, they were locked. They were locked. You, you and I think that it's just easy to lock a door, right? You just click the deadbolt. No, in Jesus' time, you would have had to like put a piece of wood on a door. This is not a half-thought thing. This is like they thought this through. Close the windows. Don't let anybody see. Hide in a place. Hide away. God had to produce a miracle. He had to teleport into wherever they were and say, here I am. First miracle, he showed up. Second miracle, he's there. He said, come here, put your fingers in my side if you don't believe. They had this miracle of Jesus resurrected in front of them, magically appearing in front of them, and you know what their response was? Next week, you know what they did? They hid in a room. Okay, this time it wasn't locked, but they were still hiding in a room. Baby steps. Baby steps is what we need because the reality is as humans that we're fearful and as big as we understand God to be, we know that we're small, and we still think with our small brains. Baby steps get us to a place where we can look at death and laugh. There's only one disciple who didn't die a martyr's death, and it wasn't because he was running away from, from it, it just, it just didn't happen. Every other last one of them looked at death and said, where is your sting? Paul says it best, best in 1 Corinthians 21. He says, for me to live is Christ, which is that everything I do is for Jesus. And my death, he says, and my death is gain. Which is to say, if I do everything I can for Jesus in life, and, and then somehow the world comes and kills me, well, good. Good, then I did exactly what I was meaning to do. Because I understand that my God is God of life and death. And even though the world might try to stop me, I will be resurrected. And that is a gain because that means I get to die in my Lord and I get to do for the world what my Lord wants me to do. Because God is God of everything. And you get to be a part of that. As we bring menstrual pads to women, as we bring love to Atlanta, or maybe you get to bring someone to salvation which is truly the most greatest joy in all of the entire world. I have three kids. I have brought men who hated Jesus to love Jesus. I counter those men as the most beautiful things I've ever done in my entire life. And my daughter is gorgeous. Have you seen her? <laughs> Weakness is a reality. But you are more than your past mistakes. You are more than the current cubicle you might find yourself in. You are more than the retired life that you are living. You are more than you think you are. You are an inheritor of Jesus' gift, his hope, his love, his everlasting life, his love. Which stopped at nothing. So we might have more than just a little something we think we have. Hallelujah, he is risen. <laughs>